Good afternoon. Welcome to the joint meeting of the Lexington um, Rotary Club and also the Lions Club joint meeting, the May 9th meeting. The Pledge of Allegiance will be read by past President Spencer, the One Verse of America, past President Dan Olson, invocation, John Sherman, our welcome song, Charlie Vale. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I country tis of the sweet land of liberty, of the I sing. Two, we have Gordy, Gardy, uh, the owner of Revolutionary Hall, a fine establishment here, really good beer selection, great food. A little applause for him, he's a good guest. And for our office fans, we have the assistant to the assistant governor here, uh, Peter. Hopefully, somebody got that reference. <laughs> <laughs> You mean a bacon? <laughs> oh, wow. I, 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 Oh, we have, we have a great guest here today. Hopefully, he's going to be our next Rotarian. It's Abby uh, Sudi. Did I pronounce it correct? Close. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he has been sponsored by our assistant to assistant governor, Peter, as well. So, And he's a 
a Ryla as well. So uh, oh, wow. he's, he's checked all the boxes for us. <laughs> and works at Leader Bank and is a medical student. So other than that, he's barely not doing too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Before I do find some happy dollars, I just want to thank um, the Lions. Uh, we finally got together here after the COVID year and everything. So glad for brought all of us to be together. Both clubs do some real serious work, which we'll, obviously we'll get into that part of it. Uh, recently we met, we were invited actually to the White Tricon at Dinner Award, um, which obviously is a serious event. We've had a made fun with uh, halfway through the uh, event. The Lions Club bell went missing. <laughs> and it was detected, um, well, actually, it wasn't detected, but it was pointed out by Jim Shaw, who was the um, recipient of the uh, white, on, white Tricon Hat Award. Uh, as, such, yes. as, <laughs> as such, he was held hostage. He had to pay ransom. And past president Dan Boozer actually paid his fines for him. So it was quite entertaining uh, with that. Um, it's a tradition, it has been kind of a gag type of tradition, which um, kind of goes off and on with bells disappear. Sergeant so Arms, you are fully authorized to use any fair or unfair tactics to make sure the bell doesn't disappear. Yes, right. I'll use these two. Can I keep these? No. <laughs> <laughs> Let them have the bell. We'll take the line. <laughs> <laughs> On a serious note, with that, um, as far as um, I want to thank um, the vice chair, Dan Lucenti, also uh, Doug Lucenti. What's the name? What's the name? <laughs> Doug Lucenti, for uh, and our um, select board chair, Joe Hay, for assisting and facilitating the flags, uh, Battle Green flags being thrown at half staff in honor of Jack Maloney, our um, former district governor, and past president here. So Dan, thank you for that. I did thank uh, Doug. 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 That's right. Doug, you can find out. Doug. 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 Doug, thank you, you so can much find for that. Yes. 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 At this point, I want to um, have um, President Paula from Alliance Club say a couple words. You don't want me to come over there. Whatever you want. Am I too close to the bell? Oh, no. <laughs> I want to shake things up over there. Um, I just wanted to thank all the Rotarians for inviting us. Uh, we have also missed uh, joining you guys. Um, it's been a long two years. Um, we hope we can do it again. And, and I'm not going to attempt the bell because you guys are obviously way over protective today. Um, we'll give another two years, you know, we'll just see. Um, but thank you again, and we look forward to uh, seeing you join us next year. Fines and happy dollars. Uh, so I'll put in 20 happy dollars for a couple of things. I had a great vacation, went over to uh, the Canary Islands for April vacation, made it back, a little COVID-related stuff coming back, which was not as much fun. And then the last uh, three weeks have been spent on basically the cross fields and soft, uh, softball fields. Um, but to that extent, my daughter made the junior high team and is doing really well. And my son got asked to play on a regional select national team and he's going to try out in the end of July. So fingers crossed, he's already working out in the backyard to get in shape for it. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, the 20 happy, happy dollars. Um, I was unfortunate uh, to spend the last two months in uh, Miami. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> no. um, <laughs> and um, toward the end of the trip, you know, we're getting into the hot weather. I really hate the heat. But I also uh, hate the dolphins and the Marlins, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic city. I never really knew how nice uh, Miami is. I've heard nice things about it, but you have to experience it. Um, we were in the, um, in the Cuban section, um, which uh, is uh, Coral Gables, and uh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's a uh, lot of Spanish architecture. We got to know the rest of the city too. Uh, like any other city, it's got some nice sections, it's got some bad sections, but mostly it's a really, really nice city. And uh, we were able to spend a lot of time with our son Harrison and uh, his wife, 
uh, Sophia. So that was nice. We didn't stay with them. That was that was a no. <laughs> but we were we were about 25 <coughs> minutes from them. So we to see them quite a bit. It was really really nice. And um, in the middle of the trip, um, uh, yes, it happened. Uh, my wife contracted COVID. Miami. <laughs> but she's all right now. She's testing negative. Thank God. And uh, I never I never had it. I don't know how I got away with that. But uh, it was it was I was very very fortunate. That's so, fun, everybody. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's myself this morning now. Negative. So we're all set here. It's good to be back, though. Really, really good to be back. And uh, I love you guys all. I miss you very, very much. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, President Cleave, after Marty's presentation, I have to tell Brian that your, your talk is cut. <laughs> <laughs> We'll extend the meeting. Twenty happy dollars to have the Lions Club with us again. Uh, and hopefully we don't have any more interruptions. Yeah. 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 Doc Placenti. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I know it's not our place to do happy dollars, but I'll do it anyway. I have ten happy dollars as a thank you. The three Rotarians that showed up for our stuffing party right. to help with the um, packet making for the uh, Stamp Out Hunger event, which is um, coming out in mailboxes, I think next Saturday or this coming Saturday or something. Um, and folks are supposed to put bags of, of uh, groceries out for the postal carriers to pick up. So I wanted to say thank you. Today we gave 10,150 packets to the Postal Service to be delivered. So thank you to the Rotarians that helped. Who were those Rotarians? Yeah. Who were the Rotarians that helped? Rotarian Dan, Rotarian Allen, and President Cleve. Oh, wow. <laughs> I too, I have 20 happy dollars uh, to welcome the uh, Lions. And just to say, they're a very generous people. <laughs> I have some happy dollars. I just received the Captain Parker Award from the Sheriff of the Sky, which I was very pleased and thrilled. Anybody else? One more. Uh, Jacob, this is 20 happy dollars. This is in honor of my father, who was a lifetime member of this golf club and the past president. That's right. And this golf club meant the world to him. I, this isn't a happy, go ahead. This isn't a happy dollars. This is money that I was finding when I was not at the club. And I just want to tell you in front of the Lions group that it was because I was under a tent working with Lions members. These rude people fined me $20 while I wasn't here. But the proof was a photo taken by a cop, which I think is very bad for cops to be taking pictures of women <laughs> without their consent. Yes, on duty. So here is the twenty dollars. But I think the cop should pay a fine. <laughs> time I was refereeing at the high school level and I wanted to make the next step up to Division One. Brian took his time, came to watch me skate, made certain recommendations and put me in the right contact with the right people to make it up to um, ECAC and Hockey East. Brian, thank you for that. What do you say, give it a double voice? Big skin, big skin. You saw the film. <laughs> I'll move quickly with the business, uh, considering that um, somebody was a little long-winded. I was going to give him two minutes for hooking, but it didn't happen. <laughs> uh, scholarship uh, update. Um, Past President Jim Freeling is moving ahead with that, uh, with the three schools as far as um, candidates, and we're in the, at the far end of the um, 
as far as finishing that up. So our meeting will be um, the 23rd at Minuteman uh, next week, next, next meeting actually, as far as I'm concerned. And comedy night, past President Spencer. Oh, just really quickly, so it's coming up first weekend in June, that Friday night, June 3rd, uh, three great comedians. It's gonna be at the, uh, now it's the uh, Scottish Rite Masonic Museum. Yeah, Masonic Museum here in town. Uh, drinks, appetizers, three great comedians. Um, if you haven't bought your tickets, please do so. Um, we are going ahead. We have uh, 135 or so. We're hoping to get closer to 200. Um, so if you are interested in attending, let me know. Um, go on our website, grab the uh, Colonial Times. There's a big ad in there that you can just scan and get your tickets from that. Um, so hopefully you can see everybody there. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Weekly raffle. Oh, yeah. Raffle items, Alex Oil, Crippling Financial, and Eagle Bank. Food tickets. Nine zero zero one. Last four numbers. Nine zero zero one. Congratulations. We have a plethora of spectacular gifts for you on that table. Feel free to choose the plastic plate. Yes, right in front. I'm sorry. Where? Any of the models of the club, too? You can probably take those poster boards. <laughs> Ticket. Oh, Excellent choice. <laughs> eight, eight, seven, five. Ooh, that's probably here. Eight, eight, seven, five. Go ahead. Please help. Oh, no. <laughs> you sure you want to pass that up? No. <laughs> 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 save, save a list or something. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Next ticket. Eight six four one. Use that in your your uh, kitchen. It probably will not stop anything that's heat related from hurting you. Next ticket, eight eight seven two. Anybody? We can deliver. Which one would you like? We have a spectacular um, letter opener from RLX, and we have a spectacular cup from Eagle Bank. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble with me. I sound like you. No more loans for you. All right. Did you want that? No. No. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Last move ticket. Ooh, nine zero zero zero. <laughs> yes, sir. Past President Murray, do the honor of our speaker introduction, please. Sure, right up here. Okay. <laughs> I've been reminded it's going to be quick because the speaker has to be yeah. on the side. So Brian, about a half hour, you'd be all set. Um, I, I got to tell you a couple of things about Brian. So I really, I got to fire over here, but then I'll tell you about that in a sec too. We go read it over. But he was one of the most pleasurable people to get to speak. Please get his name. Before I had an incident, Brian had his bio, his picture, everything to me. I wish other speakers at the club would do that. I've got to beg them and drag them to give me their bios and what they want to talk about and their pictures and all that stuff. And you know, it was just a pleasure, Brian. You are super organized. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Somebody on his team is super. Linda, Linda, Linda. Yeah. 
Thanks a lot. Well yeah, really <laughs> so Brian, I thank Linda. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Anyhow, Brian's um, bio is is full of information. Usually, I can I can just take a few keynotes and and uh, mention the speaker and what it's all about. But his bio is just so full of information. I'm just going to read it read it to you. Um, and Brian, we'll stop about a half hour. <laughs> Brian McBride builds businesses at the intersection of sports technology and media. First, BURST, where he is CEO, still in play. Brian serves as Vice President of New Business Development at the NHL, the first black executive in NHL history, where he oversaw the creation of international events and broadcasting, the initial NHL Diversity Task Force, rink development, and digital initiatives. In 2019, he produced the critically acclaimed film, Willie, about the NHL first black player, we're all familiar with Willie, Boston Bruin, and now works with the US Department and Global Affairs Canada to promote the social and emotional learning message in the film for schools across North America <clears throat> and around the world. He has served on the boards of the New York Roadrunners, the Armory Track and Field Center in New York City, the Make, <clears throat> the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy in Boston, and is co-chair of the Carnegie Initiative, an organization that works to make the sport of hockey more accessible, accepting, and inclusive. He enjoys mentoring smart, relentless business builders and social entrepreneurs, has been a leader on social justice initiatives for decades, he is an avid hockey administrator, and has started 26 marathons and completed them all. Yeah. So, I, it is my pleasure to have Brian step up now and speak with us. Thank you. Cool. Marathons feel like a long time ago <laughs> after uh, I ruptured my Achilles on vacation. So I'm, uh, I'm on the injured reserve already. Um, so first, the first thing I have to say is thank you. Um, the, the gratitude, the acknowledged gratitude for the happy dog I've never seen. Seriously, I, I was like, wow. I mean, and thank you also, um, it was mentioned some of the students that um, fortunate enough to be the recipients of your largesse and, um, and your caring and, and all that you do for this community day in and day out. Um, my daughter, Marielsa, was one of those students this year. She was a senior at Lexington High School. Um, some of you interviewed her, and she was fortunate enough to, uh, to receive a scholarship from her. So thank you for that as well. Um, it's just a small, small piece of, again, what you do in this community, which is incredible. Thank you. So it's not lost on anyone. Work, and that's a lot of time, and that's a lot of years. It's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and it's a lot of teammates. It's a lot of friendships that, that go into that, into that, into those words and into that bio. One, one particular piece of that that, um, that I'm especially proud of is the work that I've been fortunate enough to do with my friend Willie O'Reed, who Cleo has spent some time with and met. And um, for those of you that don't know him, he's an exceptional, he's, he's just an incredible guy. And um, that, this work started on my desk 30 years ago when I was at the National Hockey League. And it really started before that when I was a 10 year old. And I wanted to be the first black player in the National Hockey League. And then when I was living in, when I was growing up in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Canada, and I went to the library and I found his picture and words that he was the first black player. And I was pretty angry with him for about two years. <laughs> <laughs> but I got past it. I worked through it and got past it. I made my way to the National Hockey League. I was fairly second, seventh higher in 2003. And um, one of the first things that I, I put in my sights was finding Willie O'Ree. And um, there was no Google. And Willie was, um, for lack of a better way to put it, he was forgotten. People forgot what he did and who he was. And um, so I called a friend of mine in the FBI. 
<laughs> swear to God. Um, and and he said he said and he's a hockey fan. He goes, oh yeah, we'll go to the rim. And he said, give, give me a couple of days. And a day later, my friend Rodney called me and said he's a he's a security guard in San Diego at a hotel, and um, everyone had forgotten about him. And so I said, oh, that's amazing. I, I just that that hit me like a ton of bricks. It really did. This guy had blazed history and, and overcome incredible things. I knew what it took to get there, and everyone had forgotten about him. And um, so I got on a plane, went to San Diego, and and I met Willow. Um, I'm going to stop there to show you a quick trailer, a two-minute trailer of, of the film that we made um, a couple years ago about Willie, and then I'll tell you a story about meeting him for the first time. Willie. Should be on, unless it timed out. <laughs> Hey Doug, no recruiting. He's going to the Kiwanis. I know he is. I'm going to be careful what I say. Here we go. Here we go. met Willie. Sorry, it's very weird to hop to <laughs> I've never seen it all. But when I first met Willie, one of the things that really struck me was his, his earnestness, his graciousness. I, I um, was in his office, and by the way, that film you can get for free on Peacock. It's free. We made sure it was free for reasons that I'll explain in a second. And um, <clears throat> and he tells the whole story. You gotta watch me a little bit, a lot of Willie, but it, it's worth it and it's really fun. Um, and it's great for kids. It's a great film for kids, specifically made for that, with that intent. So I'm in his office, and which you'll see in the film, and I look up, and there's about the size of one of those, this huge plaque, about that size, and, and it's the Order of Canada. That's the highest civilian honor given to any citizen by the Canadian government. And there it is. And I was like, whoa, but, you know, that's incredible. And right next to it, are two plaques, smaller plaques, where he was employee of the year at Capital Cup. All work matters. All work is important. That's what it said to me. And I was like, this is the guy. This is the right guy. And um, so I hired Willie, and I hired him when he was 61. He's now he just turned, he's 86, he turns 87 this October, and he's still doing it. He's still traveling the country, bringing kids from all backgrounds into the loves and he's exceptional at his job he um there, there's just no there's very few people that are better at what they do than willie o'grady it was um incredibly emotional two months ago so from that humble beginning of standing in his office and talking to him about the opportunity and, and he wasn't sure if he could do it you know what can i really add i was like willie <laughs> you just just yourself just be yourself and and he's done that and fast forward to to January 18th this past year, and I stood there with thousands of other people in the Boston Garden watching his jersey go to Raptors, become the 12th Boston Bruin and have his jersey retired. The next day, the next day he was um, was voted 426 to zero by the members of Congress to, to award him with the Congressional Gold Medal. 
these guys can't agree on much, right? <laughs> that they agreed on, right? So, so that's 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 been his path, and it's incredible. He, um, I talked to him last week. He's still going strong, and uh, he's excited about the next chapter post COVID, where he's going to get to travel again, and um, just he, he doesn't have an off switch. So it's been an incredible, incredible journey to work with him and to watch all this happen. One funny story about Willie that I will share that um, you heard it briefly um, in, in, the, in the video. Um, Willie had played 22 years of pro hockey. Um, he, he made the NHL, he only got a 45 game career, 16 NHL, incredibly hard to make against Rocket Richard and you know, Gordie Howe and incredible players in that day. And he, um, but he made it and he um, was up with the Bruins for those 45 games, got traded to Montreal, ended up in, ended up playing 22 years in the highest minors, in the high minors. Um, and he did all of that with one eye. <laughs> he, lost his, he lost his eye when he was 18 years old, puck deflected. Oh. Yeah, he lost his eye. He, um, <laughs> he kept that a secret for 22 years. So that he could play hockey. His doctor said, "You'll never play again. This is it. You're done." And um, and he said, "Well, it took me about three weeks, but I was back out on the ice and <laughs> doing this thing." And um, he kept it a secret the whole time because they knew he knew that he would never he wouldn't be allowed to play play in the National Hockey League um, any further. So um, his sister knew, and, and that was it. And he told told the world afterwards after he retired that he did all of that. So incredible, incredible guy, which I'll, I'll come back to in a minute because it's important. That piece of the puzzle that, uh, that, we're, that we're working on. So he's been overcoming these barriers for, for, for just years. That's, that's, what he, that's what he's done. And, you know, the barrier of race to start with. And then, the, and also simultaneously in parallel, the barrier of disability, right? Um, you know, we I talk in the work that I do, I talk about marginalized people. And marginalized people, a lot of people say, oh, okay, they're talking about race. But it's much more than that. The biggest minority group in America are people with disabilities. And as we get older, that group is growing. It's one of every four people have a disability, either seen or unseen disability, right? And they often get pushed to the side, excluded, right? So the work that we do, um, both in terms of the films that I, that I make and um, the, the stories that we tell are about inclusion, about getting the best out of everyone, everyone's strengths, everyone's abilities being marshaled and channeled to do great things because there's so much that people can offer who may not be, um, who may not be you know, centered or the, or the focal point of stories, right? One of those stories, back to you know, a partnership, um, has anyone here ever heard of Julius Rosenwald? Anyone know that name? This is one of the stories that really struck me when I learned about it recently. Julius Rosenwald was the Jeff Bezos of his day. He had the good fortune in the 1880s of meeting a gentleman named Richard Sears. And the two of them built Sears Robot into just the monstrous, you know, Sears Robots, right? Which is just the vestiges of, our, vestiges of it are still hanging on in different parts of the world. So from the, in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, they built this just monstrosity of a retail business. And he was the guy who really figured out behind the scenes you know, how to print the shirts and how on a 24 seven basis, and how, to, how to just fulfill all of that demand from a, from a at, uh, at the time, a catalog a retail business. He figured that out. But more importantly, what he did in 1910, he got together with a gentleman named Booker T. Washington of Tuskegee Institute fame, a Jewish guy and a black guy. And what they did is so singular and so incredible and startling that America doesn't really know about. What they did between 1910 and 1954 was they created 5,000 schools across America and they taught black America how to read. Incredible. Right? They taught Maya Angelou how to read. They taught John Lewis how to read. They increased the black literacy rate in this country by four X in four decades. They changed the world. And they did it in a way, Rosenwald and, and, um, and Booker T. Washington did it in a way where they, they insisted, it was so brilliantly thought through, he's one of my heroes, 
he insisted, they insisted that the money only be matching grants, that they gave would only be matching grants. And the reason that they did it was they wanted the black community to bond, to build that, to replace that esprit de corps that just 30, 40 years earlier had been destroyed by slavery. As people selling off family members purposefully as part of, of, of slavery, right? To keep control of property, dehumanizing people. They wanted to rebuild that. And they did that by saying, for every penny you put in, every dime, every nickel, we'll match it. The black community ended up raising more money than they contributed. And they rebuilt some of those bonds that had been torn asunder over, over hundreds of, over two, three hundred years. The final piece of the puzzle for Rosenwald, which was, again, sheer genius. He died in 1932, but he bequeathed his money in such a way that his, in his will, Money went to pay for Brown versus Board of Education to put his schools out of business. For 20, 20 years after his death, 22 years after his death. And it's brilliant, right? So those are the stories that are out there being, that are, that are out there in America that people are not talking about. And that one's not talked about because it was a black guy and a white guy working together to do something that was hard and controversial in many places. And they did it, and the world really doesn't know about it. It took us until nine months ago to talk about Tulsa, right? The awful things that happened in, in Greenwood and Tulsa. <clears throat> so there's stories that are hard and dark, you know, East St. Louis and Wilmington and Detroit, and there's just a whole litany of those really hard, dark moments in America. But there's also the aspirational stories, the gratitude stories, like Rosenwald and, um, like Rosenwald and, uh, and Booker T. Washington. There's, there's lots of those, people who were witness to, who were impacted by, who were party to um, incredible events and moments in this country of overcoming real hardship and, and, and odds that you know, were long and, and, and huge. So, so those stories are the stories that we tell, um, that my company is telling right now, like Willie, a story that people have, or stories that people have, have forgotten about and largely pushed aside. Um, so we're bringing more and more of those stories to the fore, but really under the umbrella of big I inclusion, not just just race or just um, you know uh, gender. Or I mean, there's, there's just a lot of people who have not been included um, in, in a in a thoughtful, intentional way in America, and we want to make sure that that happens. Now, there's been incredible progress. Don't get me wrong, I mean, I'm the beneficiary of that progress. I was in the first Head Start class ever, ever. You know, and learning how to read at four or five years old, you know, put me on a trajectory where I was able to go to good schools and, and be here and do incredible things. I live in Lexington, you know, it's incredible progress. But that doesn't mean that it's time to rest. And that doesn't mean that we're done. We've not fulfilled our promise. We've not fulfilled all the greatness of this country stands for and purports to achieve. Not right there. Right? We've seen that in the last few years. Right? It's come to the it's come to the surface. We've work to do. So how do we go about doing that work? Well the way we go about it is with intentionality. Cleve was was gracious enough to serve as our head of security for an event that we uh, an organization that we created called the Carnegie Initiative that was referenced in, in uh, by Murray at the top of the Top of the conversation. The Carnegie Initiative was named not after Andrew Carnegie or Carnegie or any of the Titans of Steel. It was named after a gentleman named Herbert Carnegie. Herb grew up, um, in, he, was, he was from um, from the Caribbean, grew up in Toronto, and he preceded Willie. I'm, I'm, I'm an historian, and um, in, in large part, Herb was one of the best hockey players in the world in the 1930s and 40s black individual who, um, who played for the Quebec Aces, the highest team in the minors underneath the National Hockey League at the time. And he played from in the 40s, the last three years of the 1940s, he was the leading goal scorer in the league, the league just below the NHL, leading goal scorer in the league, set records. He trained, this is much to a Boston chagrin, all of those Montreal Canadiens players who went on to win 10 Stanley Cups in the 1950s. 
in a in a one on one conversation with my friend Jean Beliveau, who you may, you may remember that name, one of the greatest players ever to live. I said, "How good was her?" And he said, well, "He taught me everything I knew." I said, "Mr. Beliveau, seriously?" He goes, "I'm not exaggerating, Brian. He was he was transcendent. He was so good." And I was like, I, I was stunned when I heard this is 20 years ago. When I had this conversation, that was one side of the conversation. On the other side of the conversation, I asked her, why didn't you make it? And he got really quiet. And I said, you know, and he said, you want to know? And I said, yeah. He goes, I went and I tried out for the Leafs. And, um, and I was the best player on the ice, as told to me by, and this is the name, by Con Smythe. Hmm. Hmm. Everyone knows what that means, or if you don't, the Bruins are playing right now for the Stanley Cup and the best player as judged in this tournament amongst all the teams wins the Conn Smythe Trophy. <clears throat> Hockey has its own monuments, its own statues, its own history, okay? That some of it they're not proud of. So her, her with tears in his eyes, he's in his 80s, he passed away 10 years ago. Tears in his eyes, he tells me this story. He says, um, I was the best player on the ice. I was told by Conn Smythe that I was the best player on the ice and that he would pay anyone $10,000 to paint me white. He never played a game in the National Hockey League. They kept him out. And it, 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 it crushed him. What he did, and that's not why we named it after him. We named this initiative after him because of what he did in response to that. In 1955, December 1955, the exact same week that Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on that bus in Montgomery, Alabama, Herb started the Future Aces hockey program that brought white, black, and indigenous kids in Toronto together to play together. 1955, and he did that for six decades, quietly. Anson Carter, Devontae smith Pelly, Wayne Simmons, these are all names, Joel Ward, they all played in his programs. And he did that quietly for six decades until he passed away. So Herb, uh, excuse me, his daughter Bernice and myself are the co-chairs. There's people like Brian Burke and Ron McLean and Grant Fuhr and um, you can go down Sarah Nurse, the Olympic hero from Canada this past Olympics. You go down the list, incredible people who sit on this board now. We had our first event, and this is where Cleve was nice enough to help us, he was the head of security for this event, in Boston, tail end, knock on wood, of the pandemic two months ago. And um, we brought 250 people together in Boston, the Bruins, the NHL, JP Morgan Chase, Canadian Tire from up north, Duncan, they all sponsored us. It's an incredible organization that is working on making hockey more inclusive. But hockey's just a metaphor. It, it, it's just the vehicle. That's all it is. This organization is really about opportunity, right? About all kids getting a chance to play, feeling welcome in spaces where they traditionally have not been, and people acknowledging and understanding that and making them feel welcome and that they have access and opportunity there as well, okay? So we did it in Boston. Next year, we're gonna do it in Toronto. And again, big eye inclusion, very local question. And this is near and dear to my heart because it, I'm sure it is to you too. Um, I, I know he was a member of the Lions Club. Who here knew Hank Vance? I won't get emotional. But um, I stood shoulder to shoulder with Hank Vans over the last 22 years at Hayden and uh, at the Edge, and we and built a youth hockey program. I'm there every Saturday. I'm doing what I can. It's taken six of us to fill Hank's shoes, but I'm one of the six who do that. I'm the commissioner of LVYH right now, Lexington Bank of Youth Hockey. And two years, not many people know this because he was so humble. Two years ago, Hank was recognized with the Thayer Tuck Award as the volunteer, as the as the um, uh, premier volunteer for USA Hockey across the United States. He was awarded that. And the reason he was awarded it, I saw it personally. He'd come in on a Saturday morning, Brian, you gotta see this, you gotta see this. He was an engineer, he was a naval guy, very precise, right? And just so involved and so dedicated. And he said, I checked out this Youth Hockey Association and in Brattleboro, Vermont, this is what they're doing. And here's what these guys, 200, 250 of them, over 20 years he studied. So the 
point where he made Lexington Bedford youth hockey, it is the crown jewel. And I'm, I came from the NHL and I was involved in youth hockey. I know them all. This is the best one in America. And it's because of Hank Nance. Okay, and I'm gonna tell you why this matters, and how it plays forward, and how he's still giving to inclusion, even though he's no longer with us. What he figured he wanted to, a program that would, where everyone would play the same amount of time, where everyone was valued, where everyone could contribute. You know, he had these, he listed them, and he sent it to me in an email. I was like, Hank, hey, that's tough. And he goes, well, we can do it. And he kept that, kept that every year, he tweaked and improved to the point where USA Hockey saw it, and they, they used that as the template for America now, with what Hank built. Not many people know this, I'm Men's Hockey Insider, so I got to see all of this firsthand, both here locally and nationally. And he, the way he did it was he had five and 10 year olds playing together. And the, what he figured out was those five year olds were so intimidated by those 10 year olds, right? And the 10 year olds are kind of like, oh, they're on my team, you know, the little guys, right? So he, what he figured out was the third line, five and six year olds, they play against each other for two minutes, buzzer, everybody off. Six and seven year olds, off. Nine and 10 year olds, off. So that everyone got the same amount of time. When that five year old who could barely skate at the beginning of the year scored the winning goal in the championship, which happened often, that kid was just, that was Hank and that was his design. Get the best out of everyone. And that's what he did, right? And, and he tweaked it and made a draft so that even if kids were not as good as the seven and eight year olds, they'd play with the five and six year olds, right? So that they, you know, he just, he figured out all the nuances of this. Fast forward to last week, Linda and I are on a phone call. And we've had this idea and this dream to how do you include, really include blind, deaf, para, missing limbs, um, um, sled hockey players, and special um, hockey players right? with, 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 with disabilities, mental disabilities, and, and challenges that uh, you can't ordinarily see, but they, they, their struggles for different reasons to make them special hockey players. How do we get them all together? How do we get them included? They're being left out. If you're a blind kid, you're not playing hockey, I'm sorry. Is usually the answer that people give, right? It's just too much of a reach for people to wrap their heads around. We met, fast forward to last year in Boston, we met a guy named Mark DeMontis, who's the leader of the Canadian Blind Hockey um, Association. And Mark lost his sight when he was 17. He has spent the last 20 years working on blind hockey and how to adapt it in a way where the puck is this beacon and he's just, they figured out all of these rules. You can play an ordinary ice rink where blind players and blind kids can play. Somebody else similarly has done that work um, for deaf players, for special players. So we are going to, we fast forward from Boston last year to next year in Toronto in January, where we have the Carnegie Initiative in January in Toronto um, with the Maple Leafs and the NHL and all these wonderful sponsors. We are going to, we're going to do the first adaptive mixed use um, showcase game where we have those five categories, blind, deaf, para, special, and sled hockey players all playing on the same teams. And people were like, on this call, we're like, how are we going to do this? And, and it hit me, Hank, blind kids are going to play against the blind kids. The deaf kids are going to play against the deaf kids. And we're gonna put a template against that online and say to every youth hockey association in North America, it's free, come get it, take it, make it yours. And include all of those kids that otherwise would sit at home and not be part of this. So that when that special hockey player, blind hockey player, deaf hockey player, when they score that winning goal, that means we're gonna keep score. I mean, you know, so if you've got an even number, six blind hockey players, six deaf hockey, you know, and so on, right? Two, four, eight. So you get one on two, three, four, eight on each team. When we keep score and, and it's real and there's people in the stands cheering for them, that's inclusion, that's Hank Nance. And that's born out of the work that happens here in Lexington, Massachusetts. And it's not lost on me, and it's not lost on us. So, in, in, in conclusion, um, 
thank you all for giving me the opportunity to, to share these stories, uh, to share the work that we do, that we're embarking on. There's a long way to go and there's a lot to do, but it is work. People talk a lot about the racial divide in this country right now and the other divides in this country right now. It's the best to solve that is the best and the most important work we'll ever do in our lives. We'll make the country greater and we'll make all of us greater. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Very kind. Of you. 